In this video, we're going to examine paediatric advanced life support from the perspective of an OSCE. To be deemed fully clinically competent, you will need to spend time examining the Resuscitation Council's PALS guidelines, as this video is for OSCE purposes only and not meant as a substitute for the guidelines, as there will inevitably be more detail in the full guidelines and you're advised to use them for all clinical situations. For now, we will focus purely on the essential criteria for a paediatric ALS OSCE. To do that, we'll build on the paediatric BLS algorithm, which we have examined previously. And in broad terms, that consists of scene assessment, initial approach, basic airway management, identifying cardiac arrest, and CPR. In this session, though, we're going to build on that basis and examine the extra components of ALS. Main categories for this are defibrillation, advanced airway management, IV or IO cannulation, and drug administration and timings. Many of the skills we're going to discuss and demonstrate here are going to necessitate some interruption of CPR, and so it's important to highlight a key principle throughout, which is that according to Recess Council guidelines, at any point during the resuscitation, CPR should be interrupted for no longer than five seconds. This is a key principle throughout your OSCE and the resuscitation period. So let's highlight some key points. In defibrillation, we're going to look specifically that the pads are attached correctly. We'll look for an immediate rhythm check, for correct rhythm recognition, that we have pulse checks where appropriate. We'll be looking for safety considerations and that CPR is continued while charging the Zoll. And again, that there's no interruption of longer than five seconds of CPR. Moving on to advanced airway management, some key principles here include a stepwise approach to airway management. So we're going to start simple, looking at simple manoeuvres like a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust, depending on the situation. Moving on to an OPA, then considering an MPA, eye gel or endotracheal intubation where appropriate. We will want to see you conduct endotracheal intubation and for that you're going to have to use an appropriate technique. We'll be looking then for checks, so we'll be looking for the tube to be inserted under direct vision, looking for rise and fall of the chest, for auscultation to take place bilaterally and over the epigastric region, for waveform capnography to be put in place, and that the tube is secured. And again, no interruption of longer than five seconds of CPR at any point. For IV or IO cannulation, it's important to note that gaining rapid vascular access in children is often quickest using an intraosseous needle. So this should be used in preference to an IV cannula unless a suitable site for IV cannulation is immediately apparent. And we will want you to do IO cannulation in your paediatric OSCE. Key things we're going to be looking for though are aseptic technique throughout. You'll need to identify a correct insertion site. You'll need a correct and safe insertion technique using the easy IO sharp safety and disposal and securing the IO cannula and a flush and for IO this is going to be using a three-way tap. Once we've gained IV access we now need to consider drug administration and timings and the general principles behind this are the same as adult advanced life support with variations in the dosages. So here the key points are rhythm checks every two minutes, we're going to look at administration of adrenaline, 1 in 10,000, and amiodarone, but timings of that is going to be dependent on whether the patient is in a shockable or a non-shockable rhythm, just like with adult ALS. Dosages are also going to be age or weight dependent, depending on the age and weight of your child. Once we've considered all of this similar to adult ALS, we can then start to think about reversible causes. So let's have a look at it in practice. So here we have an unresponsive patient who is deemed to be around about seven years old. And we're gonna quickly run through the refresher of basic life support. Having assumed that we've gone through our scene assessment using a smart approach, and we're gonna start from our initial approach to the patient. So we're gonna check for a response from the patient. Hello, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes, please? And that's using both a verbal and a physical pain response stimulus. We're then going to look in the airway. Now at this juncture there are two possible options. If the airway is apparently clear and there doesn't appear to be any foreign body in the airway then we can move on to opening it and then securing it with some sort of airway adjunct. The other possibility is that there could be some sort of foreign object obstructing the airway and that could take a number of different forms. It could be liquid in nature, so mucus or blood or vomit, or it could be a physical foreign object that the patient has swallowed. 
but then subsequently choked on. In this event, we're going to need to remove it as first port of call, and with a large physical object, we're going to use McGill's forceps to remove them, as is seen here. But in the event of some sort of liquid occlusion, we're going to want to use postural drainage coupled with a finger sweep potentially, and then use suction to clear the airway prior to opening it. Remember to suction under direct vision and only as far as you can see. Once the airway is clear, we can then open it, and there's no sign of C-spine concern on this occasion, so we're going to use a head tilt chin lift. Then we're going to need to size up and place an OPA. Now remember that as this is a paediatric patient, we're going to insert that OPA anatomically with the airway so that we avoid damaging the soft palate of the roof of the mouth. Once this is finished, we're then going to expose the chest and look, listen and feel for breathing for up to 10 seconds. In the event of there being no breathing, we're going to give five rescue breaths. And then we're going to reassess for breathing and check for a pulse again for up to 10 seconds. Now, because this patient is over one year old, we're going to be checking for a carotid pulse rather than a brachial on this occasion. So as per the paediatric ALS algorithm, with a pulse of less than 60 beats a minute or an absent pulse, as on this occasion, and no breathing, we're going to diagnose cardiac arrest. And so we're going to start CPR. And we'll do that at a ratio of 15 to 2, at a rate of 100 to 120 a minute, and a depth of a third of the chest. Now you can see that again we're taking an age appropriate technique and for this size of patient we're looking to use a one-handed CPR technique. Now it's at this point in the OSCE that we move from BLS towards the ALS side of things. And the first thing that's going to happen is your crewmate is going to join you on scene and you need to ask them to attach the pads. Here's for your cardiac arrest, can you put the pads on for me? Now it's important that pads are attached correctly and you can see the correct placement here. This pad placement obviously assumes a size of patient which is able to take those pads in that location. If you have a paediatric patient that's too small to take the pads in that location, you need to alter your pad placement accordingly. This may mean that you need to place one pad on the patient's chest and the other on their back, directly opposite one another. However, on this occasion, due to the size of the patient, we are going to use the standard pad placement. Once the pads are attached, you need to switch on the defibrillator and do a rhythm check as soon as possible. According to the Recess Council guidelines, this initial defibrillation attempt takes precedence over everything else, including a blocked airway. Now, it's important to stress that this is for the initial defibrillation attempt only. Every subsequent defibrillation attempt and rhythm check is secondary to an airway problem. However, this first check needs to take place as soon as possible, and if indicated, then the defibrillation needs to take place immediately. This is because research suggests that the initial defibrillation attempt is by far the most successful when it comes to returning the heart to a spontaneous circulation rhythm. Now, how you proceed will depend on whether you're in a shockable or a non-shockable rhythm, and we've been through these rhythms several times before, and so you know that your shockable rhythms are VF and pulseless VT, and your non-shockable rhythms are asystole and pulseless electrical activity, or PEA. But the first thing that you're going to need to be able to do is to correctly identify the rhythm that you're in. On this occasion, we're in ventricular fibrillation, or VF, and so we're in a shockable rhythm, and we're going to charge the monitor. OK, we do a rhythm check. VF, confirm VF. Confirmed. OK, so we charge for me. Now, because we have a seven-year-old patient, JR Calc states that we need to charge the defibrillator at 100 joules. And so we're going to do so with ongoing CPR. Remember that it's really important to have no longer than five seconds off the chest at any point, whether it's defibrillating or managing the airway. So we have ongoing CPR while the monitor is charged, and then we need some really clear safety checks. This is your opportunity to make sure that everybody is safe, including your crewmate and anybody else that is assisting you with the arrest. Now this is going to consist of environmental concerns, or your five P's, so patches, piercings and pendants, playtex, pacemaker and perspiration. But you're also going to need to give some good, clear verbal commands. Okay. okay everybody clear, top, middle, bottom clear, oxygen away, shocking, back on CPR. Now as soon as we've delivered the shock, we're going to carry on with a further two minutes of CPR, regardless of what's shown on the monitor. 
Now, it's a good opportunity at this juncture to ask your crewmate to take over CPR. You can do so before the shock or you can do so after, but your crewmate is going to need to take over CPR so that you are free to carry on with things like IV or IO access and airway management. Now, at this point, you have a choice. You can choose to either deal with the patient's airway and obtain a more secure airway prior to transport, or you can look at IV or IO cannulation. Now, in the real world, this decision is going to be entirely based on the clinical situation that you're in and is going to be dependent on the patient's circumstances. And in Anofsky, this may occur as well. If the examiner states that the airway is problematic or if the patient has vomited, for example, then your hand may well be forced. However, it's also possible that you may have a choice and you can choose to do either first so long as you can justify your choice given that particular scenario. On this occasion, we'll deal with the airway first. Now, we are going to go through a demonstration of paediatric intubation and this is because it is still within a paramedic scope of practice, although certain ambulance services are no longer allowing their clinicians to perform it. And this is because there is a significant amount of skill fade associated with this skill as it is something that has come across quite rarely on the road. And the Resuscitation Council themselves do recommend that only experienced clinicians are advised to attempt to intubate paediatric patients. And so while we are going to demonstrate it for the purposes of the OSCE, we would advise you to use a supraglottic airway like an eye gel as your first port of call, unless you've had significant exposure to this population group in this setting. It is possible that you may end up post-qualification working for an ambulance service that does have it as part of their repertoire. And so we are going to go through it. And you will have an opportunity to practice it and include it in your OSCE if you deem necessary. In terms of the OSCE though, if you are able to secure the airway using a supraglottic airway like an eye gel, then we will allow this and potentially talk through the intubation afterwards. So just like with adult intubation, the first thing that we're going to need to do is to prepare the equipment that we're going to need. And the list of equipment is actually very similar, the main difference being in terms of sizing. However, because of a lack of paediatric Thomas tube holders, we are going to need to secure the ET tube manually, and we're going to do that using a manual tie. Part of our preparation for intubation, as well as equipment, is thinking about patient positioning, and because of the size of this patient, we're going to put them into what's known as the sniffing the morning air position. The idea being that we bring the tragus of the patient's ear into approximate line with their sternal notch. And in doing so, we facilitate a better angle of view along the axis looking down the length of the trachea. Now, there are anatomical differences between paediatric and adult airways, and they do vary from age to age. One of the key points that's relevant to intubation is that paediatric patients tend to have a proportionally larger epiglottis, which is the cartilage that sits on top of the larynx, providing airway occlusion during swallowing. However, this can obviously contribute to a visualisation problem when it comes to paediatric intubation. And this is a particular issue for when it comes to patients who are between the age of 0 and 2. And so we have a change of equipment in that age range from a curved blade on the laryngoscope to a straight Miller blade. And this can be placed over the epiglottis rather than into the vallecular space to allow it to be moved out of the way. And while you still need to be aware of the danger of laryngospasm, this does better facilitate insertion under direct vision. However, for children over the age of two, it is advised that we use a curved blade at the appropriate size for that size child. So the OPA is removed, laryngoscope is inserted, and the ET tube is inserted under direct vision. Again, because this is a seven-year-old patient, we're looking at a size six tube as per JR Calc. Now, depending on the size of the tube, you may have a cuff to be inflated, or you may not in the smaller tube sizes. On this occasion, there is no cuff on this tube. Now, we've elected not to use a bougie on this occasion, as you can see. However, dependent on local guidelines, you may be required to. And Resuscitation Council guidelines do state that you do need to have one available in the event of you needing it. Now, you can see that all of this needs to take place within the space of one round of CPR. And that is a challenge, but with sufficient practice, you should be able to achieve this. Now, we're then going to check tube placement by looking for equal rise and fall of the chest and auscultating on both sides of the chest and over the epigastric region. We're also going to connect waveform capnography. And remember that during all of this, we're aiming for no longer than five seconds off the chest at any one point. Once we've verified placement, we can then secure the tube using the tie, as we stated before. We will go through this again in the practical session so you can have a closer look at the actual technique involved. We will also then need to reinsert the OPA to use as a bite block in the absence of a Thomas tube holder. And as you can see, we have waveform capnography attached as well as a catheter mount to take the pressure off the tube. 
Having established a secure airway, we find that two minutes has elapsed in our cardiac arrest scenario, and so we're due another rhythm check. So again, we've identified the rhythm, and we can see that we're still in ventricular fibrillation, which is a shockable rhythm. So we're going to charge the monitor again at 100 and go through our safety checks to perform defibrillation. Okay, off the chest. Everybody clear. Top, middle, bottom clear. Oxygen sewage unit shocking. Because this patient is now intubated, we now need to check tube placement after defibrillation. So we're going to do that by keeping an eye on ETCO2 and the waveform capnography and by auscultating bilaterally both sides of the chest and over the epigastric region when ventilating. At this point then you would move on to IV or IO cannulation and you've already covered that in a previous session so we're not going to go back over the procedure in this video. However, it is important that you follow the correct procedure and maintain your timings as far as rhythm checks and also ensuring that you're not off the chest for any longer than five seconds of CPR at any one point. We would then be looking at drug administration dependent on the rhythm that you're in. And while we've covered the timings for this drug administration in the adult ALS algorithm, it is important that you look at the dosages as these are different dependent on the age and weight of your patient. So you're advised to check JAR calc for any drug dosages that you need to administer and also to refer to the Resuscitation Council guidelines on PALS for the actual timings of the drugs. It's important that you familiarise yourself with the correct algorithm from the Resuscitation Council and act accordingly, giving the appropriate drug at the appropriate point. You can then start to look at reversible causes and the treatments for these are very similar to in the adult ALS scenario. However, there will be variations in particularly things like quantities of fluid or glucose dependent on the reversible cause that you are treating. It's important that you familiarise yourself with the page per age pages of JR Calc as these will give you the appropriate dosages. Please make sure that you know where you're looking for the cardiac arrest sections on those pages as it's not always immediately obvious on first glance. And remember that you are going to be doing this in quite a stressful environment if you come across this for real. Thank you for watching. We hope you found this video useful. Your next port of call should be to look at the full guidelines on the Resuscitation Council website and also to look at JR Calc's algorithms on the subject.